It is great to be with you this morning. I want to say thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to get to preach the Word of God. It's an honor and privilege to be uh, Josh Moody's uh, brother in the Lord and his friend. Everybody has good friends, and then everybody has people they go to war with. And it's my privilege and uh, joy to say that Josh Moody is a brother that I'd go to war with on any given day. And so I'm glad to be worshiping with him and get to see where the Lord has brought him and taking him. And I trust that you are uh, being well cared for and shepherded. And and I am uh, grateful to help in that this morning. And to teach you and to preach to you this morning from the Word of God that there is a covenant God who loves and saves the murderer. There is a covenant God who loves and saves the murderer. Do you watch CSI, Crime Scene Investigation? It's a, it's a series on television, if you don't know. Um, I, I don't watch it. Uh, I don't like murder very much. Um, and the details of it sort of gross me out. But I, but I know it's, it's a really popular show, right? I, I did, did in-depth research on Wikipedia. <laughs> and uh, it let me know that the show's been running for about 15 years. It has uh, 73 million viewers. If you'd like to purchase an ad in primetime television when this show is running, it will cost you a small amount of $262,000 for just 30 seconds. There's over 300 episodes. There's three spin-off series that are currently on the air. Uh, There is a book series, a video game, and at one point in time, I believe, there was even an exhibit in your very own Chicago Museum. It is the seventh longest running scripted U.S. primetime series ever, and it's been named the most watched show in the world five different times. I had zero idea it was so popular, and I wonder to myself why. What makes a show like that so incredibly popular and engaging? I'm sure, though I've still never seen a full episode, it is well done. Uh, I'm sure... uh, there's the new ways to look at crimes, even though these murders and such has been part of entertainment since entertainment has begun. Uh, all the technology is really cool, and they do all these neat things. But at the end of the day, uh, I suspect that the core reasons that a show like this and others are popular are the same. And that is because that deep in us, uh, we have a desire for violence. Even, even just measured violence, but violence nonetheless. And we also we have deep in us a desire for resolution, for conclusion, for justice. These things also dwell in us. The August 31st, 2007 uh, Columbia Journalism Review has crime and social violence as its sixth most popular out of 19 news categories. That's why you see murders on your local and national news. Apparently the shock of murder gets us out of our routine and it stirs our emotions. And the resolution of murder then perhaps gives us some sort of hope. Uh, A hope that the system works. Or a hope that justice does live. Or a a hope uh, or maybe a peace that there's just one less bad guy out there that might get me. So this morning then we're going to look at one of the most famous murders in human history. Cain's murder of his brother Abel. And instead of trying to figure out who done it, because we already know, um, or a, a... deep, detailed look at the motives, though we're going to talk about those. Uh, Most importantly, we want to see if this story from Scripture has any meaning for us. If, If God is still who God says He is when murder happens. If there's any justice for the murdered. Or if there's any hope for the murderer. Let's read Genesis 4, 8 through 16 together. It's it's in your bulletin. You can follow along as I read. Cain spoke to uh, to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I do not know. 
Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and away from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of the Lord. A covenant God loves and saves the murderer. And this is good news because my first idea or point to you this morning is that we are the murderers. Now, I suppose that's not the phrase you wanted to hear as you woke up out of bed this morning, wanted to worship the Lord. You probably didn't look in the mirror and go, there I am, the murderer. But it's the truth. And a quick recap of events and progression through the scriptures will help us understand this. Right? If you, in case you don't know the story, Adam and Eve bear two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain's a farmer, and he brings an offering before the Lord. And Abel is a, is a shepherd and herdsman, and he brings an offering of his first fruits, the first of his flock, for sacrifice to the Lord. And the scriptures tell us the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but not Cain's, because the nature of the gift always coincides with the position of the heart. Abel gave his first fruits. Cain gave what was second. And Cain is angry and jealous about this offering being rejected. So the Lord lovingly confronts Cain earlier in chapter 4. He says, hey, why are you angry? Why, why is your face sad? And then the Lord reminded him of the truth. Do well and you'll be accepted. Don't do well. And sin will ruin you. And then the Lord exhorted Cain, you must rule over your sin. Why does Cain murder after such a a reminder of the truth and and, and a a good rebuke and a a foreshadow of what would take place if he didn't respond to the Lord? Well, the the obvious answer is that he's jealous of his brother Abel. Not only is Abel's gift being accepted by God, but but he's also jealous of the relationship that the gift reveals. He walks with the Lord. He's in the Lord's presence. But, But then what's the source of jealousy? Well, jealousy is resentment against a rival or a resentment against a person who's enjoying success or an advantage over you or just enjoying resentment against them and having success or advantage in and of itself. And this sort of resentment left unchecked can turn into a selfish anger, right? An anger that you don't have what you want or I don't have what I want or I don't have or you don't have what we think that we deserve and it becomes a covetousness that's untamed and unbridled Bonhoeffer that great preacher of the confessing church during World War II in Germany and his lectures turned into books titled Creation and Fall subtitled Temptation gives a less obvious but more penetrating answer for resentment and jealousy hatred For God. See, God had regard for Abel's sacrifice precisely because it was given with a heart to worship the one and only God who made him. The one and only God who pursued relationship with him. 
the one and only God who gave him all that he needed in this life and the life to come. Cain's angry at God. Cain has a hatred that that he cannot have all the same sort of relationship without acknowledging that God is his creator and his sustainer of all. Cain's angry that his life is not like he wants it to be. So he takes it out on his brother. And Cain is wrong. And we understand that, right? We understand that we hate, because we don't like to be wrong, do we? We don't like to confess that we're wrong. Recently, I was on vacation with my, uh, my wife and her family. There was 14 of us, uh, eight adults, six children, sixth grade and uh, down to uh, two years old, uh, in a cabin in Pigeon Forge. It was a delightful time. It really was a good time. It's a little cramped, but it was really a good time. We got to see our family. We were, and as you do with family, we were sitting around having conversations about past and present and future and all those sorts of things. And one of my, one of my in, brother-in-laws, I think, said, hey, Jay, do you remember the time where you tried to tell us that you were an introvert? Now, if you've been around me for about five or seven minutes, you'll know, you don't have to be a psychologist or trained to know that I'm not introverted. I'm clearly extroverted. That's where I find my energy and around people and such. But when he said that out loud in front of everybody, it sort of caught me off guard. And I just simply retorted. I said, I said, I never told you all that I thought that I might be an introvert. And as easily as it came off my lips, there was this Greek mythological-like retort from all of my in-laws going, Oh, yes, you did. And I was like, Oh, well, I guess I'm wrong. And I, while I don't still re- recollect that I said that, I'm sure I did because they all were be- bore witness that I did. And it, I, we don't like being wrong. But we like less to confess that we are wrong. And so when I say that we're murderers, well, there's good reason that I say for that. Because Jesus says we are. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You're probably familiar if you've been around for a little while, but it says, let me read it to you. It says, We've, you have heard that it, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And we all agree with that. But Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be, able, will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Those are really strong words for being angry. And, and even to the, to the point where some people today say, oh, that just can't be true. It's too harsh. To which I would reply, if you don't understand the harshness of the judgment then perhaps there's something you're missing about the holiness of the God. If you're going to follow a God this morning, make sure that God is holy and perfect without blemish. And everything else starts to fall into place. Again, the scripture says in another place, in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you break one part of the law, you break all of it. And, and these truths are what makes Christianity wonderfully distinct and different. See, all the other religions of the world and, and all the cults of the world are, are trying to give you degrees and categories for some sort of righteous hierarchy so you can see how good you're doing and ultimately applaud yourself for how far you up on the ladder. But Christianity levels the playing field of all humanity and says you're absolutely in light of a holy and perfect Savior, dreadfully sinful. And we hate hearing that we're sinful. We hate hearing that we're wrong. But the Lord speaks it clearly. So if you're here this morning, and, and by the law of the land, it says that you're not a murderer, then praise God, we're glad you're here. And if you're here this morning... And you've actually committed a murder somewhere in your past and you paid your debt to society and now you're freed because you've done that and you've repented to not do that again. Well, then so be it. We're 
still really glad you're here. This is a place you can be loved and accepted and given a second chance. I trust that because this is a room full of Christians. But if you're here this morning and you're outside the grace of Christ, then the scriptures tell us that from the pulpit to the last pew in the building, we are the same murderers. And that we will get what we deserve. Judgment from a holy God. Because God promises to bring justice on the murderer. This is what verses 9 through 12 teach us. It, it teaches us that the Lord wants to bring a conviction of sin in our lives. To tell us that what we're doing is wrong. And a conviction of sin that says what you're doing is against the holy God of the universe. Well, that's from the Lord himself. And we should be glad that he's telling us that we're wrong. John Calvin, the great reformer, wrote, As often then as the secret compunctions of conscience invite us to reflect upon our sins, let us remember that God himself is speaking with us. For that interior sense by which we are convicted of sin is the peculiar judgment seat of God where he exercises his jurisdiction. The Lord convicting us is a sign that he is with us and among us. J Jesus said in another way to, to his disciples before he went to the cross, he, he said when, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of the world is judged. The Lord is forever trying to show us our wrongs against him so he can position us for salvation. He can make us right with him. And, and even in our story, the Lord communicates with Cain the same things. He's the same God from beginning to end. And he communicates to Cain in two really specific ways. And the first is in gentleness. He, he kills his brother, and when the Lord comes to Cain, his first step is not accusation. His first step is a gentle question to allow Cain to confess, where is your brother? Confess to me, Cain. Tell me. We're in relationship. I love you. Tell me, where's your brother? And instead of humility and contriteness, Cain then hides behind a veneer of, of sarcasm. Am I my brother's keeper? Listen, if, church, if we're going to try and hide from God in this lifetime, but I want to tell you clearly this morning that God is going to love us enough to expose us and pull us out and remove the veneer and remind us that he knows our sins and remind us that we are responsible for our sins. And again, this is exactly what he does with Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. And the Lord then turns from this gentleness and he turns to this judgment, right? This second way. And he says, what have you done? Right? Saying, saying wake up, Cain. Don't, don't hide. He said, your, the Lord said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain, you're not hiding. I know exactly what you've done. And then he curses Cain. He says, you're cursed from the ground. Cain's a farmer. He's telling Cain, you're no longer going to be able to do what you were designed to do. He pronounces that Cain will be a fugitive and a wanderer. That he'll no longer be where he's designed to be. Right there in the presence of God. You know, we can look at this verse and, and, and find a good parental application. Maybe some good parental advice in this. Parents, you, sh you should approach your kids with first with gentleness. I'll, I'll never forget uh, when I was a, a, a mighty first grader and I received a sad face note home from my first grade teacher, Miss Barrett. And my father saw this sad face note and he was greatly displeased. And told me, if you, if you get another one of these, it's going to go bad for you. You know, you don't, you know, do not get a second sad face note. So, like all good first graders do, I, I quickly and swiftly got a second sad face note. 
But knowing my impending doom, I, uh, I came to my home and I grabbed the note and ran upstairs. And uh, where you, will the parents have to sign it to bring it back? I, I very artfully printed my parents' name in the blank. And then I hid it underneath my dresser very safely till tomorrow morning where I could sneak it back out of the house and take it to my teacher. So I go back downstairs and I sit and, and have a snack and watch a cartoon or something. And, and my mom comes to me and she says, uh, Jay, where are your papers from school? And I said, uh, they're, in, they're in my lunchbox. So my mom goes and she gets them and she comes back to me moments later and she says, hey, she goes, um, are these all the papers that you got home from school today? And I said, yes, ma'am, they're all there. They're, they're all there in the lunchbox. That's where they're at. She goes away, and she comes back a third time, and she says, Jay, I'm just going to ask you this once more. Are these all the papers you got home from school today? And in my mighty <clears throat> six-year-old voice, I looked square my mother in the eye, and I said, Mom, these are all the papers I have gotten home from school today. She was gentle. She was gracious. Three times gracious. To which she responded the last time, Jay, I just got off the phone with your first grade teacher, Miss Barrett. <laughs> it's time for you to go upstairs and wait for your father to come home. <laughs> it was not my best day. Uh, parents, talk with your kids. Uh, let, give them opportunity to confess. Don't just bring punishment to them. Don't just whimsically do this or that. Or don't just respond in your own anger or your own embarrassment or your own whatever. Talk to your kids. Take them to lunch. Do whatever you got to do. If they, if they disobey, then sit them down and get face to face and talk with them and give them the time and space to articulate sometimes motions they don't know how to say. Always give your kids the chance to confess. Always. But this passage is not simply good parenting advice, is it? This passage is the difference between heaven and hell. This passage is the difference between grace and judgment. Because the same God that brings judgment and justice on the murderer is the same God who will provide salvation for that same murderer. Because, because Cain, he hears this judgment and he's overwhelmed. Right? He, he says, Lord, this punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, let me be very clear about something. Remorse does not always equal repentance. Remorse says, I'm sad that I did a certain something. Repentance says, I'm sad about whom I've done something against and want to turn away from it. Cain is overwhelmed at the consequence for his sin. Because he, he's no longer able to know the presence of the Lord and he can't do what he was designed to do as far as being a farmer. But he doesn't seem to be penitent against the sin. He's just fearful, right? He's just fearful that he'll lose his life. It's a good word for us because that's, that's how our society lives. We just don't want to die. But God in this, even in his remorsefulness, without repentance, God is clearly merciful and gracious because because Cain says this is where I can bear I'm going to start wandering and then somebody's going to kill me ironic isn't it that he's afraid of the very thing that he committed but the Lord stands up and he says not so he he puts a mark on Cain's life to let everybody know that Cain's life has been spared by God Right then and there. And, and the mark of God's grace is that Cain has a chance to repent. And because of the mark placed on Cain, any time in the future, nobody can touch him. He has this time and space to repent to the Lord. The Lord has given you and I the same opportunity to repent, to turn to him. But there's also this mark of unrepentance in the scriptures. Right? Verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden, out of his presence. 
The rest of the scriptures seem to tell us that Cain never did really repent. In Jude, verses 10 and 11, it says, But these people blaspheme all they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of grain. 1 John chapter 3 Verses 11, the first part of 12 says, For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. God provides salvation for the murderer, and he's provided salvation for you this morning. Because Christ died on a cross for your murdering, for your anger, for your resentment, for your jealousy. He got on a cross and bled and died to the glory of God and the benefit of those who would turn to him and say, you're the one true living God of the universe. Do you follow him? Have you turned to him today? And, he, and just as Christ, as Christ, who is God, put a mark on Cain's life so nobody would mess with him, so as a believer, as a follower of Christ, he puts a mark on you, the Holy Spirit. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You might be here this morning, and you might be wrestling whether you're really saved or not. And one of the markers you need to ask yourself is, do you have a conviction of sin? And not just a sin of wrongdoing or a sin against your brother, but do you sense that, yes, what I've done wrong is actually against the creator and sustainer of this world and of my life? If so, there's probably a pretty good chance the Holy Spirit is doing a good work in your heart and your soul and your mind. But you also might want to ask yourself if you don't have any of that. If, if, if the conviction you have is just for the manipulation of people, places, and things that you can have what you want and your, wife can, and, your, and your life can be like you want it to be? Well, then maybe we are our own gods. Maybe we're angry at the one true God because our life isn't like we want it to be. And instead of hiding behind a veneer of religiosity or anger or sarcasm or jealousy, We can go to the one true living God. And we can say, you're right. You're righteous. In a way I've never known. Save me. Make me yours. I no longer want what I want. I want what you want, Lord Jesus. Mark me with your seal. The promised Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you're the greatest of all time. There's no other God to serve but you. Lord, forgive us for turning to other gods especially when we're sure it's just ourself. And Lord Jesus, please do not leave us in our anger or our jealousy or our resentment. Please do not leave us longing for something more that we think is more than what you have to give us, but convict us, change us. Tell us, Lord. Speak to us gently. What more do you want than me? And let us come to our senses, realizing that there's nothing more than you. Or that we might repent of our sins. We might turn to you, not leaving your presence, but running to it. 
even as you have never left us. We might walk out of here, Lord, determined to tell a lost and dying world that they don't have to be angry. Lord, they don't have to be jealous. They don't have to be resentful. They can be saved. Walking in your way. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen.